Thank you very much for inviting us and giving us from Pulpy a chance to really uh, represent some of the aspects of children's hand, which are very important uh, in these teaching sessions. I'm very happy that uh, Emily will start the presentation and she will give us an introduction on the growing bone. After that, we will go more specifically into different types of fracture, starting with finger fractures, going to metacarpal and finally ending with the thumb. So please, Emily, give us a, feed, uh, an, in, an, uh, a good start into the growing bone so we understand it better. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, before we started talking about the growing bone, I thought I'd talk a little bit about managing children. So I didn't realize next week was basically going to be a tour de force on the same subject. Um, managing children hands injuries is a great privilege, um, but it provides a lot of challenges over and above the knowledge of fracture management itself. And these faces are all ones you'll be, you'll be used to seeing in your children's trauma clinics. Communication is key and the child may well need heavy persuading or catching, playing with, and certainly in England, competing with ear pods and hoodies to be able to assess their injuries. Their dressings and casts need to be excellently applied, remembering that two and three year olds essentially are escape artists in training. And you need to plan their dressings and casts, and particularly the time scales for changing these very carefully. Most importantly, which I'm sure we'll hear a lot about next week, they don't come alone. Their family needs careful managing, particularly when there is guilt surrounding the injury and you have to communicate with all of them simultaneously. So whilst it's often a real challenge, it's very rewarding and a lot of fun. Let's move on to the underlying physiology and anatomy of what we're dealing with with these injured bones. Along with most of the bones in the skeleton, the bones of the hand formed by endochondral ossification. The skeleton initially forms as hyaline cartilage models, and from week eight gestation, the perichondrium is infiltrated with blood vessels and osteoblasts and becomes periosteum. These osteoblasts then invade the diaphysis and replace it with spongy bone, becoming the primary ossification centre. Ossification then continues from here to the ends of the bones, growth occurring just below the physis, and the secondary ossification centres then appear in the middle of the epiphysis. Bone growth occurs from the epiphyseal plate by cartilaginous growth, then replacement of the chondrocytes by osteoblasts, resulting in ossification of the matrix. But bones continue to increase in length and width, and it alters its shape in composition in response to the stresses and strains put upon the bone. And bone modelling is this process by which the osteoclasts and blasts interact to achieve this in childhood. We look at when these processes are occurring. At birth, no carpal bones and only the primary ossification centres are visible. The carpal bones ossify over a 12 year period. They start with the capitate and hamate at one to three months and progress in an ulnar spiral with the scaphoid visible age about five and the pisiform appearing last age 12. The secondary centres only appear at about age one to three, as you can see in this second picture. And physial fusion occurs, of course, at puberty, roughly 13 to 15 for girls, 14 to 16 at boys for boys, but very variable. Whilst bone modelling is the process by which bones form their ultimate shape during growth, bone remodelling and reshaping, a phrase we're quite common, we're, we're, we're used to talking about, is that which occurs throughout life in response to stress on the bone, but it's the same response that occurs in response to a fracture, where bone remodelling follows on from the inflammatory and reparative phases of bone healing. It's the process by which healing callus is resorbed, new bone is laid down along the lines of stress, the rate and ability to remodel is governed by age and therefore the growth remaining. The younger you are, the better the bone will remodel. The position in the bone, the closer to the growth plate, the better the fracture will remodel. And it also depends on the plane of deformity. So how much force is going to be on that bone to correct the deformity that's occurred through injury? Most importantly, rotational deformity once healed will very, very only remodel very little and therefore needs to be addressed. Daniel will be explaining this far more in detail in the phalangeal fracture section. In the paediatric population, of course, we therefore have bones that are injured, bones that are injured are programmed to heal and remodel. This means they heal really fast. An average six-year-old will heal twice as fast as an adult. This series shows a six-year-old's fracture of the middle phalanx at presentation, two weeks later and six weeks later. This does mean, of course, that non-union is exceedingly rare, 
but it means we've got a very short time frame to make good decisions. And our standard check x-ray at one week that we apply in many adult fractures will not be good enough. It'll be too late in our young children. This endochondral ossification process, which takes all of childhood to complete, results in challenges in the imaging of the children's injuries. Significant parts of the paediatric skeleton may well be radiolucent. I can see this is a three month old fracture, but the same pertains as children get bigger. Particular challenges are the periphyseal injuries, the intraarticular injuries where the secondary ossification center may, sim may simply just be a dot, and the carpus may well be entirely invisible. Occasionally CMCJ injuries may therefore need MRI or ultrasound to diagnose. The mini C arm is essential to treat children's fractures. The resolution of the standard C arm is just not good enough and departmental x-rays are of course ideal. X-rays in cast are very tricky to interpret, with fragments and their displacement being easily, easily underappreciated, and we aim to remove the casts or splints before imaging the children's hands. Growing bones are also very vulnerable. Every time I pick up a K-wire driver to operate on a child, I think don't damage the growth plates and don't burn the bone. Every path through a growth plate damages essential cells and can lead to premature fusion and poor growth. The bone fragments are also very small and very vulnerable to osteonecrosis. So the younger the child, the smaller the fragments, the more growth potential remains and the higher the potential damage. And also the younger the child, the more they can remodel. So you have to think very, very carefully whether operative intervention is needed. If we use K-wires, we aim to use the smallest wires possible, the fewest passes possible and on a very low drill speed. Before I hand over to Daniel, a quick reminder of the Salter Harris classification of growth plate injuries, which I am certain everyone knows, but knowledge of this governs much of our paediatric fracture management. Graded one to five with increasing severity of growth plate damage and impact on growth as you go up the classification. One is of course separated or slipped. Two has a fragment above the growth plate and these are the most common growth plate injury that we see by a factor of fourfold. Three is lower than or below the growth plate. It's usually an avulsion injury because the attachment of the tendon or ligament is stronger than the bone or growth plate. And four and five high energy injuries with consequently more severe results for, bone, for future bone growth. I'm now going to hand over to Daniel to focus in on what this means for the injury pattern that we see in the growing phalanges. Thank you, Emily. Uh... This is a very nice introduction to physiology, but what does that mean? Uh, or how does, what are the consequences is for, for trauma? Here you see, as Emily has shown, the grow, a growing finger. You see the appearing of the epiphysis and the gradually closing of the growth plate at the age of 14 years. But this has some consequences on growth and stability. The, little finger of a baby is very elastic, whereas it becomes more rigid over time. This, uh, as a consequence, uh, has very leads to very specific uh, trauma patterns. In a three-year-old, a fracture is very unlikely because these uh, bones are elastic and avoid uh, uh, to, to these, uh, these fractures. However, when we do see these fractures, they often look like the ones you see on, on this x-ray, where you have a high energy trauma. It's usually a crushed finger or a, a heavy object falling on the hand that causes this type of fracture. Nevertheless, the fracture usually stops at the growth plate and the epiphysis is very strong. So thereby, the epiphysis pro uh, protects the, the interarticular integrity. Growth disturbances, luckily, are rather uncommon in this age group. If we go on to a 10-year-old, the, the, the fracture pattern changes completely. It's the age where fractures become more common. It's usually the little finger. And you see that you have a metaphysical a uh, fragment of a Salter Harris II fracture, which is very common, and it runs through the epiphysis, uh, which still protects the PIP joint because the uh, epiphysis is very strong. Unfortunately, this is the age group where we do see some growth disturbances. 
If you go on to the 13 year old and beyond, the fracture looks much more like an adult fracture. The bone is very rigid and therefore tends to break and the fractures can be intraarticular. Although the growth plate is still open, it's rather irrelevant because the remaining growth on these fingers is not uh, exceptional. And so we can treat these fractures similar to adult fractures as well. Now, I would like to go on to, uh, to the treatment of finger fractures. Actually, as any fracture, treating finger fractures is easy. You need to reduce the fracture and you need to immobilize and to wait till the whole thing is healed. So if you ask yourself whether you should reduce a fracture, you need to know the, the potential of remodeling. This x-ray shows a late presenting uh, fracture uh, 17 days after trauma. And you be, may become a bit nervous when you see the severe angulation of this fracture. But since it was healed anyway, we just could wait. And you see after six months, we do have a perfect remodeling on this bone. So it's important to know about the limits of remodeling. As uh, Emily has told you before, the rotation does not correct spontaneously, and you must be as, uh, as precise in correcting the rotational deformity as in adults. There may be a little bit of the, the remodeling the, in the radio ulnar displacement, and there's a lot in the functional plane. This correlates with age, and the closer you get to the, the fracture to the physis, the better it, the, the better the potential of remodeling. So when we have this finger fracture here, it's quite obvious that you have an ulnar deviation that is far too much to be left. So we need to reduce it. In children and adolescents, it can be a big issue uh, on working with local anesthesia, and we do like nitrous oxide inhalations on our A and E. It's important that you uh, go for high concentration of nitrous oxide, because if you do with lower concentration, uh, analgesia may be an, uh, inappropriate. In, these, in this most common fracture on children's hands, which is a Salter Harris II of the proximal phalanx of the little finger, that just a strong pull and manipulation are sufficient. I do not particularly like the, the using a pen as a hypomocleon because you get a lot of stress on the soft tissue and you get a lot of shearing uh, forces on the fragment. So I think it's mostly pulling and reduction manually. So once we have reduced this fraction, the next question is how shall we immobilize it? Shall we introduce a K wire or not? I would like to show you some evidence uh, which we found from a study we've published recently. On this graph, you see the, on the two axes, the anterior posterior displacement and the radio ulnar displacement. On the, on the lower left corner, you see those for injuries with very little displacement. The darker the dot, the more patients are included within the dot. Now, if you look at these uh, blue dots, these are, the, these are the fractures we did not have any secondary displacement. However, the red ones did have some uh, secondary displacement. And as you can see easily, uh, the ones with displacements are those who had massive displacement uh, uh, initially. In a series of more than 100 patients, we found only 7% of secondary displacement. And we therefore think it, this does not justify routine application of a K-wire in all these fractures. So if you have these non-articular base and shaft fractures, we suggest that the simple immobilization in a cast or a taping is sufficient. Now, is any of these better than the other? We did a prospective randomized study where we included uh, both uh, patients with the tape and the cast. There was no difference regarding secondary displacement. However, taping is cheap, it's quick, and it usually is better for patient comfort. However, if you have fractures on the little finger, particularly if they're unstable or oblique, 
uh, analgesia may not be appropriate and these children may uh, profit of a splint immobilization. How shall we follow up these patients? Usually the children uh, fingers fractures are healed within 21 days. This is the same graph as it showed you before. Those children who had hardly any uh, displacements initially will not have any secondary displacement. And so it's optional if or if not, you do a follow-up. You may as well refer these patients for follow-up at the GP without doing any follow-up x-rays. So I would like to go through a picture where I think one needs to see an indication for surgery. Have a good look at this x-ray. I hope you have a good uh, a monitor so you can uh, see the details of the x-ray. You may have seen that there's, there's fractures on the, uh, on the proximal phalanx of the index and of the middle finger. But if you look really exactly, then you see that the shape of this growth plate is totally different in the middle finger than in the other uh, ad adjacent fingers. So it's clear that this uh, finger has got a rot rotational displacement of the epiphysis of almost 90 degrees. So in this situation, you must do an open reduction. I don't think you will manage closed and a uh, fixation with some wires. I would like to give a quick conclusion on these shaft and metaphysical fractures before, before I hand back to Emily. Most of these fractures can be treated conservatively. The typical Salter Harris II fracture, even after this location, does not need a K, a K wire for fixation. Taping is as safe as splinting, and usually after three days, these fractures are healed. Follow up X rays are optional in non displaced fractures. Uh, on non-displaced fractures. Now, we come to the tricky ones, Emily. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Uh, some of them are tricky, some not so much. <laughs> the distal phalanx is commonly injured. It is the end of the digit and most vulnerable to crushes, axial loads, and getting caught in things. And as such, the middle finger is most commonly injured, and they're very often open injuries. The three most common and important patterns of distal phalangeal fractures I'm gonna discuss our tough fractures, briefly, uh, Seymour fractures and mallet injuries. Tough fractures are basically managed according to the nail bed injury, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. They rarely require fixation and only really, as in this case, when they're completely translated and unstable despite soft tissue repair, where a single axial KY may be needed. That was the easy one. Seymour fractures are open, displaced injuries to the distal phalanx growth plate that result from hyperflexion of the fingertip. They're most commonly sporting or crush injuries. They are relatively rare, however, being only about 5% of all paediatric distal phalanx fractures, but they're really important, as we'll see. And there may be a Solteris type 1 or 2, type 2 with little dot as you see here. They may well be misdiagnosed as a mallet injury because the finger is often similarly deformed due to the extensor insertion proximal to the growth plate and the flexor insertion distal to it, as in this top diagram. However, the extensor is intact, the phalanx gives way rather than the tendon. And this is the common pattern that we see in pediatric injuries where the, ten the tendon and ligamentous insertions are incredibly strong. This, injury also this diagram also demonstrates that the fracture is anatomically adjacent to the nail bed, which is therefore also injured either as an injury in the substance of the nail, but all more commonly, an avulsion of the very base of the germinal matrix. Radiologically, they're best seen on the lateral view and may present with obvious displacement as in these top two pictures. However, the x-ray findings may be very subtle with only a slight widening of the growth plate and a tiny dot pointing you to the true pathology visible on the lateral. So you have to have a high index of suspicion to correctly diagnose them. The nail bed is commonly displaced. On examination, nail bed may be flipped up above the epinicule fold, as in these pictures, and the increase in the height of the visible nail bed compared to that of the contralateral digit, digit will point you to the pathology. More concerning is that the nail bed may instead be trapped inside the growth plate, which not only prevents fracture reduction, but may lead to infection. The usual treatment of Seymour fractures is formal washout in theatre 
which should be as soon as possible. There's some pictures of what we do in theatre on the next slide. Um, Rays and Ho looked at 48 Seymour fractures with a mean age of eight and found a delay of more than 48 hours resulted in a 12-fold increase for infection rate compared to those done within 24 hours of injury. We give them IV antibiotics and induction and the nail budget is repaired in a standard fashion with the nail plates removed and small incisions made so that we can see the junction of the epinicheal fold and paronychium and see the germinal matrix fully at its origin. The nail beds freed from the growth plate, washed thoroughly, and meticulous closure of the nail bed performed, usually with small absorbable sutures. I use 7 over repeat in the under 12, 6 0 in the teenagers. I know Daniel prefers Maxon. I find that where the germinal matrix has been truly evolved from the fold, the repair is really tricky and usually just place simple corner sutures to reposition it in the epinicheal fold and ensure it doesn't fall back into the growth plate. I have a low threshold for KY stabilization. If the fracture stays well reduced with limited mobility on clinical testing after the soft tissue repair, I'll use only a splint. But if there's any mobility, I'll place a single axial wire across the joint, as small as 0.6 to 0.8, depending on the age of the child. So despite appearing as a potentially insignificant injury, these fractures are associated with a high rate of complications, with the reported rate being between 45 and 62%. If the injury is not recognised, it can be under-treated, under-reduced, and a KOR potentially placed without removing the nail bed from the growth plate. They may be more unstable than initially appreciated, as in this 13-year-old, where the patient was treated with washout and nail bed repair in the theatre. Check x-ray at a week showed that the fracture had slipped, and it was manipulated, however, at two weeks was still dorsally slightly displaced. That would have been prevented with a KOR. This is the same case at two weeks and then at three weeks, and you can see a dubious lucency appearing. He's developed osteomyelitis. At this stage, there was a persistent serious ooze from the epinicular fold. He had further washout and six weeks of antibiotics and the wound healed, the bone settled, but it healed with an early growth plate closure and this bony deformity you see in the final picture. Nail dystrophy is also very common. Even without infection, in a Seymour fracture, the bone is vulnerable to disturbed growth. And in this case, with early central fusion of the growth plate, whether that's due to the initial injury or the KOR, I don't know. She's only six, so this may well have significant long-term effects. So in summary, we know that Seymour fractures are relatively rare, but they're often missed. And you have to have a very high index of um, high level of suspicion to diagnose them. They should be treated urgently within 24 hours and a KY is often needed for stability. And all these things will enable us to treat them well and prevent the severe complication of osteomyelitis. Moving on to mallet injuries. These are very common in adults and they are much less common in children and are usually seen in the teenage population with closing or closed growth plates. We know they're caused by an axial load, most likely with a forced flexion of the extended distal phalanx and the results an injury to either the extensor tendon itself, a soft tissue mallet, or an avulsion of the tendon insertion resulting in a bony fragment, either a Solteris three or in a closed growth plate, uh, a true large fragment. In children, 80% are bony, whilst in adults, only 20% are bony. Diagnosis is straightforward, with the patient unable to actively extend the DIPJ, and of course, a Seymour injury must be ruled out by careful examination and scrutinizing the X-ray. Whilst a number of classification systems are described for mallet injuries, for the patient in front of you with a closed mallet injury, there are these three questions, which put the mallet injury into one of these four categories. Is the injury soft tissue or bony? If bony injury then, and in joint, then it's type two. If it's subluxed, but holdable in a splint, type three, and if it's subluxed and not reducible in a splint, type four. This classification system suggested by Batero does address this and I find it really useful because it guides treatment. So the last group is the only one that actually needs surgical intervention. All the rest can be managed with just a splint and 95% of all bony mallet injuries, particularly in children, do fall into categories two or three and not four. Conservative management involves splinting, maintaining extension of the DIPJ long enough for the avulsed tendon to reattach or the bony fragment to unite. In general, in paediatric injuries, we tend to splint for a shorter time than adults, 
But because mallet injuries almost always occur in the more skeletally mature or close to mature teenager, we do split them like adults with these time scales. There is no evidence supporting any particular type of splint, dorsal, volar, pulse bearing, knot, bit of hyperextension or not. The most critical thing is that the patient must not at any point during the splinting period remove their splint or time is reset to day zero. Splinting can cause maceration or even ulceration of the skin. So teaching the patient good skin care is essential whilst never allowing any flexion. There are over 24 publications on different fixation methods for bony mallet injuries, all of which are in adults, none of which are in just children. The only consensus really is that bony mallet injuries to subluxation, even if subtle as shown in this second picture, um, do need some sort of surgical intervention. There's no evidence suggesting that the size of fragment alone is an indication for surgical management, particularly in the paediatric population. And the goals of our surgery are reducing the subluxation and aligning the joint, whilst, of course, minimising complications. How do we do this? The most commonly used technique in children's mallet injuries, and that which both Daniel and I prefer, is the Ishiguru technique. The dorsal wire is placed first with the fingertip in full flexion. It must be proximal to the fragment. The actual wire may enter volally, as it was originally described by Shiguru. However, many subsequent descriptions and publications place this wire actually instead with good effect, and it's the method that I use. The wires stay in for four weeks, with a further two weeks of splinting after their removal. So in summary, mallet fractures are rare pre-puberty, tend to manage most of them the same way as adults, 95% are managed in a splint, and there is evidence for surgical intervention if they're subluxed and not correctable in a splint. If we require fixation, we'd recommend the Ishiguro technique of K-wiring. Over to Daniel. Thank you, Emily. I hope all the audience is still uh, with us with all these uh, different type of fractures. I think the phalangeal neck fractures are particularly interesting in children. I like the, the classification by al Katong. There's it's straightforward, type one, no dislocation, type two, bony contact, and all the subtypes of three without bone-to-bone -bone contact. Now, you may uh, have a good look at this X-ray. You see there's a relevant uh, dorsal angulation of about 45 degrees. There's some uh, ulnar displacement as well, and just a little step off. Now, would you or would you not operate on this child? Actually, if you go to literature, you may find that many people would have operated on this type of fractures a few years ago. However, we have two very good uh, pub uh, publications by NC Tan in 20 and Al Katan in 21. And they both point out that the potential of remodeling of these uh, neck fracture is important. And uh, we probably overtreated them surgically uh, in the past, and we can uh, leave this to remodeling more liberally, particularly in the young child. This is another uh, the situation. If you look at this X-ray, it's clear that there's no bone contact. So we have a type three fracture. The problem is if you have that severe translocation, that probably the movement of this joint will not be normal and very difficult to remodel for the, for the body. Personally, I like uh, to do reduce them close and then introduce, introduce an axle K wire. Actually, I may use a, a slightly smaller K wire than the ones I did at the time. I'm aware that some people do use crossed K wires through the fragment only, but I must admit that I find this technique much more difficult and therefore go for the simple one. And, uh, but then hope that I just have one pass through the joint. How about this one? Have a good look at it. I think it's important to have an excellent X-ray and I hope you have excellent monitors at home. If you do so, you see that this white line uh, on the, on the X-ray is where the cartilage is. So this uh, phalangeal neck is rotated by almost 180 degrees. It's clear that we need to reduce uh, this fragment so we have bone-to-bone -bone contact for appropriate healing. I like uh, reduction with a lateral incision, 
and uh, immobilization with the K-wire. Try to be gentle. Even, the, even like this, 30% uh, of these fractures may have avascular necrosis when treated surgically. In conclusion, I think there's clear agreements about the type one that needs conservative, conservative treatment and type three. In the type two, we are not really sure where the limits of uh, remodeling are. I think in the younger child, we may accept the rotational dislocation of about 45 degree, and there's even a little bit of uh, radial angulation that can be tolerated. I go on to intraarticular fracture. There's sometimes a misconception that these may remodel in children. They do not. You see this uh, uh, fracture that healed in a, in a displacement of the joint. The problem is that you have a, a severe dysfunction of the joint with a rotational and angular def dis deformity of the joint, and it's very difficult to reduce secondarily. So be aware of these fractures. If they are uh, like this one and you, you get them initially, make sure you get an excellent lateral x-ray because in the PA view, it looks pretty good. But if you look at the lateral view, you see the two condyles are, uh, are uh, properly aligned, whereas this fragment is tilted. If you have appropriate uh, instruments, and you get the child early, treatment is really easy and straightforward. These reduction forceps uh, are particularly handy because you can introduce the wire through the forceps where you would intuitively put your forceps. Now, I think we're done with the finger fractures, Emily. Your turn for the metacarpals. Yeah, um, I'm very jealous of that last instrument that Daniel has and I want to acquire where I can K-wire through a reduction force. Um, most injuries in the younger age group are falls or sporting injuries. And of course the brunt of force is taken by the fingers. But as children play more vicious contact sports and start to display anger, so the adult patterns of metacarpal injuries creep in. As the majority of metacarpal fractures occur in the over 12 year old age group heading towards skeletal maturity, quite a lot of these, we tend to manage them more as we would adults. And I won't be going into detail in the majority of them. However, we have to remember the key facts driving all our decisions in children where they're growing, they have growth plates and can remodel. So our tendency towards conservative management is even greater. I'm going to be looking at metacarpal fractures two to five and then Daniel will be coming on to talk about the thumb in a minute. When we think of metacarpal fractures, we immediately think of the boxers type fifth metacarpal neck fracture in an angry teenage boy. This is for very good reason. Over 50% of fifth metacarpals fractures are injured at the neck Male to female ratio is 13 to 1, and 95% of metacarpal fractures occur in teenagers. So our brain switching to this image isn't wildly off. However, whilst I will come on to talk about the metacarpal neck fractures, other metacarpal injury patterns are worthy of discussion, whilst more rare. I'm going to break them down anatomically by region, starting with head, then neck and distal shaft, and then mid shaft and base. Metacarpal head fractures are very rare. In a younger child, where the secondary ossification centre is not yet fully formed, diagnosis can be tricky, and a tiny flake may be a much more significant injury. In the older child, it's more obvious, and yet can be very significant, as in this 13-year-old who simply fell from a bike. It's pretty clear that the entire head has been totally displaced. We know that metacarpal head fractures are associated with avascular necrosis, particularly when there is a significant displacement and it may result in growth arrest. This teenager was treated with open reduction and K-wiring as shown. It did heal well, however, he did have growth arrest resulting in a three millimeter loss of metacarpal length at hand skeletal maturity two years later. Happily, it wasn't a functional problem. When we come on to the management of much more common metacarpal neck fractures, the conventional treatment that we were all taught during training in adults suggests that the acceptable angulation for restoration of normal function is 10, 20, 30, 40 degrees as we go across the hand, two to five. 
However, a recent review of multiple articles looking at the management of ad adult metacarpal neck fractures showed excellent outcomes in up to 70 degrees of angulation with conservative management and no manipulation. And that certainly mirrored across my practice. We also have to remember that, of course, children remodel. So if the ch children are younger, it makes even non-intervention even more appealing. So we manage the majority conservatively. If we conservatively manage them, the main question is how? Widely reported options include buddy taping alone, used in my unit for almost all metacarpal neck fractures, a functional brace to protect the body of the hand, a combination of the two, or an arm on the gutter cast. In the cast, the MCPJs could be an extension or flexion. And in our practice, we do sometimes manage our patients in a cast, usually to protect them from themselves or because they're in a lot of pain and discomfort, um, rather than to manage the fracture. Is there a role for manipulation? This requires a far longer discussion, but the evidence and indeed our practice suggests no benefit of under 50 degrees angulated and only 15 degrees benefit at follow up if it's 50 to 70. So we don't manipulate that often. And if we do, we do plaster them for three weeks, but x-ray them within the first week, aiming for five days or so. So what are the indications for operating? So I think almost absolute indications for operating are true rotational deformity. As we said, it won't remodel, but it's actually very rare in these swift metacarpal neck fractures. More common is that pseudo rotation you see with swelling in the fourth web. 100% displacement is fairly obvious when you know the bones just can't reasonably heal because they're not near each other. A concurrent metacarpal head requiring uh, reduction of that. And other indications may be an angulation of more than 70 degrees and when the fracture is slightly closer to a distal shaft fracture rather than a true neck. These are less impacted and less stable, and therefore I'm more likely to intervene. But they are case by case on an individual basis. And most importantly, of any younger child, there may well be a huge remodeling potential. The most widely used and reported fixation technique is that of anterograde intramedullary nailing or bouquet wiring. It's fairly straightforward and can be done using one, two or more wires. I favour two 0.9 millimeter K wires and tend to leave them buried but remove them at about six weeks. I know Daniel's preference is for a single larger wire. This isn't one of his cases, but it's this sort of principle, similar technique. And both of these one or two wires will achieve good reduction, replace the head of the metacarpal on the shaft and keep it there long enough to heal, not heal well. Whilst children will remodel, the fact that we, the fact that we use in adult management that less angulation is accepted on the radial side of the hand is still true. And this second metacarpal fracture, 42 degrees angulated, was treated with intermodellary K wires. I'm afraid I don't have the post doc views, um, but it's definitely not acceptable. Where in the fifth, we would accept that. We come on to metacarpal shaft and base fractures. The majority of these are seen in, of course, adolescence. Management depends on the level of skeletal maturity and therefore the potential for remodeling. As we know, the acceptable angulation deformity decreases down the metacarpal. And while we would not intervene for a 50 degree angulated neck, I usually would for a mid shaft fracture and certainly would for, at the base. The acceptable angulation is also less on the radial side, mirroring the management of the neck fractures. The closer the child gets to skeletal maturity, the more likely I am to treat them as an adult with inter either intramedullary K wires like the neck fractures or plates of mid shaft and quite significant angulation. I'm usually guided very much by the size of the child's hands compared to the parents. I often get the a teenage boy to put their hand against their dad's hand to see how close they are to being fully grown to guide my treatment. As in this 15 year old with hands the size of his father's, fourth and fifth metacarpal fractures treated with dorsal plates. Interestingly, he had a full range of movement at three days post op and consequently overdid it quite a lot in his physio, returning to sport far earlier than advised. I think that's why we can see this element of secondary rather than primary bone healing at his fracture sites. Metacarpal fractures in the under 10 year olds are rare, but worthy of special attention because to break a metacarpal in a small child requires a lot of energy. As a result, you need to think of compartment syndrome, think of the amount of energy that's been transferred to that hand in order to break those fractures at the base of it. Fractures themselves will usually remodel very successfully, oh sorry, as in that previous slide, and can be managed conservatively like this third metacarpal shown in this five year old. <clears throat> 
In this patient who's four, and this is a girl under Daniel's care, he, she had a very heavy weight land on her hand. And you can see these fractures to second, third, fourth, and fifth metacarpal shafts. All are extra articular. But you can also see the large soft tissue shadow on her hand. And this was borne out when you examined her clinically. Um, and she had a hugely swollen hand, very tense, such pain as you'd see in an adult with the same sort of picture. She was taken to theatre urgently and the dorsum of her hand was opened and you can see this dark, severely crushed muscle. The third metacarpal was wired and the wounds were closed with dermal matrix. Her fractures healed and remodelled well and her growth has continued normally due to prompt recognition and rapid treatment. So in summary of this little section on metacarpal fractures, head fractures, you need to be aware of avascular necrosis and growth disturbance. In the neck fractures, we manage most conservatively, particularly if they're under, six, under 70 degrees angulated. And if operatively, we tend to prefer intramodullary K wires. Fractures at the shaft or base in the under 10s, you must think that's a high energy that's been transferred, worry about crush and compartment syndrome. And most of our patients are in fact teenagers and we manage them similar to how we'd manage our adult population. On with thumbs. And over to Daniel. Thank you, Emily. So uh, we end up this session with the thumbs. We're getting to the end of the skiing season in Switzerland. And this is uh, the typical uh, accident we see. Uh, particularly it's dangerous for the thumb in skiers where they, they, they hold a pole. Now have a good look at this x-ray. Is there anything that bothers you? It's a child presenting after a fall in the snow with some pain and slight swelling at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Probably those who are working with children recognize straight away that this is a pseudoepiphysis. We see on the first metacarpal, we have a proximal growth plate and the pseudoepiphysis is a very common finding. According to age, it may look very different. We are pointing this out because we get uh, referrals uh, for fractures in these uh, pseudoepiphyses, which actually are just a normal finding every once in a while. The skier's thumb equivalent, as I would call it in children, is actually a salt or Harris II fracture. Why is this so? The ulnar collateral ligament is a very strong structure. And in children, it's much stronger than the bone itself. So if you have this uh, injury, it is these forces applied to the MP joint in a thumb, you rather end up in a fracture in a young child than in, a, uh, in an ulnar collateral ligament injury. So if you have a normal X-ray in an under 10 year old, it's extremely unlikely that you have a ligament injury on the thumb. It may just be a, a twisted uh, thumb that heals easily. However, the older the child uh, gets, the more likely it becomes that there is a uh, ulnar collateral ligament uh, avulsion fracture, which we call skier thumbs, others more like a gamekeeper thumb. In this non-displaced fracture, it's, it's a straightforward treatment with a short immobilization for three to four weeks. And we advise protection for sports and other activities as long as it's painful or at least for another two weeks. I would like to give you uh, evidence on what is an acceptable displacement of a fragment. Is it the size of the fragment? Is it is the, the displacement? Is it the involvement of the surface uh, of, the, of the bone? We don't really know, and there's very little evidence in the literature. There has been a recent study on children that showed that those who were treated surgically all healed nicely. But we do not really know uh, when we, we overtreat them. If you have a huge fragment and a clear instability, a, a screw, as in the adult patient, is always a good solution. You can guarantee an anatom anatomic reduction. However, an, a bone anchor, as applied in this, in this child, is a good alternative. It does not allow an anatomic, often doesn't allow a perfectly anatomic reduction, but this is most likely not relevant for the future course. Uh, 
However, the likelihood that you further uh, fragment your, uh, that, that, that you further break the fragment is much smaller than when introducing screws. You can also use K wires. However, it's clear that these must be uh, in conjoint uh, together with a good cast because it doesn't uh, neutralize all forces. Uh, this is an interesting uh, activity of this child beginning to spring away from the winter and the forces, they are no smaller than they were before. You see a very typical uh, fracture of a child. If you look exactly, it's not a salt carries, but often these fractures are just proximal to the growth plate. If they are non-displaced, they're not a big issue and the, the child can be put in a cast. <coughs> You shouldn't forget to do the follow-up x-rays and they must be done early, five to seven days. And it's clear why. What you see here is the equivalent to Bennett fracture. This fracture here has a strong pull by the AD doctor distally and may up, end up as in this patient in with a uh, complete displacement of the fracture. So yes, you can do a uh, conservative treatment of these patients, but you must follow them to, to look out for secondary displacement. Usually you can do a closed reduction and uh, a simple pinning does hold the, the fragment, the, the, the thumb in place. I often use just a single K wire because in children you will always uh, add an, an splint uh, to the to the to the osteosynthesis, so this is sufficient if it's uh, introduced nicely. This is basically the consequence of a similar pattern mechanism. In the middle, we see the patient at the age of ten year, which we have just discussed. On the right hand side is the benefit fracture of the adolescent to be treated just in the adult. But I think it's important to have a very close look at the x-ray of the nine-year-old patient. You again see the pseudo uh, epiphysis, but no osseous, uh, no, no bony fragments, no fracture. But nevertheless, this is not a good situation. If you draw, pull, draw a line, you see that, of course, the thumb is, uh, uh, there's luxation at the CMC joint. In children, it can be very difficult to recognize because the scaphoid is uh, just the cartilage or almost post cartilaginous, and there is very little ossification uh, center. So, if you're in doubt, don't hesitate to do an ultrasound or, if not available, an MRI or CT scan. Usually, when when uh, treated initially, they can be closed. Uh, they can be reduced closed and even treated without the K-wire. So it's difficult to do a take-home me messages after all these fractures we've uh, shown you of, over the last uh, 45 minutes. I think it's important to realize that we, you need good prerequisites. You need excellent X-rays and image intensifiers if you go to the OR. Don't hesitate to send the patient back to the x-ray if the, the, the picture wasn't taken appropriately. If you go to theater, particularly with the young child, it's important to have an experienced pediatric anesthetist. If you treat these uh, children, most of them can be treated conservatively and immobilization is short with three to four weeks. Of course, we've shown you all those. You shouldn't miss the rotation deformity, the semi fracture, the phalangeal necks, and the luxation. If you go to theater, usually a small K wire does the job, eventually two K wires, and keep the drilling speed low. We don't want to do burn the growth plate. Thank you very much for staying us for such a long time. I think we are still 150 people online. Uh, as in the beginning. Those who do like uh, to work with children and uh, see them in their daily practice, uh, have a look at our organization, the Pediatric Opelin Project. We are very involved in teaching. Uh, we organize symposia and we do webinars and case discussions. We have an updated uh, 
uh, homepage and come back to see us. I thank Holly and Carlos very much for giving us the opportunity to talk to all to you about these fractures. Thank you very much. And thank you, Emily, for joining us in this session.